Thank you. Well, I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to whomever accepted my application. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fantastic place to do research. So I feel very privileged to be here. Well, we made a video of you uh, you with next time, and we have to present our case. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say a few words about these uh, systems with logarithmic interactions. And I will start in the world of random metric theory. So let's take an n by n um, matrix. But let's take it random in a pleasant way. So what's the easiest way? Let's take coefficients uh, iid and Gaussian in C, so complex Gaussian. And I have to specify the mean and the variance, but that's not important for me. Uh, today. Um, so I get n eigenvalues, um, zn. So with, proba with probability 1, you get n distinct eigenvalues. I'm sorry? No, no. So I take completely iid. I do not impose symmetry for the moment. Um, so th so the, the eigenvalues are in C. And um, I can ask, well, what's the probability of observing a certain n tuple? And it turns out that in this specific case, you can compute the law explicitly, and you get something like this. And then dz1, dzn. OK. And I think the first one to do this computation was Geneva in the 60s. Okay, let me do the same problem, but now I'm going to impose symmetry. So I do the same thing. I take IID coefficients, but only up to symmetry. What do I mean by that? Really, what it means is that you take your matrix, you fill half of it with IID coefficients, and you complete the matrix in order to, so here you just, whatever you've chosen here, you take the conjugate and you put it here, so you impose symmetry. Um, and once again, I take Gaussian coefficients. And here I can take them real or complex, or even if you're into that, you can take them quaternionic. There is such thing as quaternionic Gaussians. Um, so you have real eigenvalues, eigenvalues, xn. And you can ask the same question, what's the probability of observing a certain interval? And so sorry, I should not say equal. It's proportional to. There's, a, there's a, just a, a normalization constant. Well, and then you get the same thing. Uh, xi, xj, plus sum of n xi square, dx1, dx. And what is beta? Well, beta depends on whether you've chosen your Gaussian to be real, complex, or quaternionic. And it's 1, 2, or 4, depending on your choice. Here again, I'm not sure was the first person to do this computation, but there is a wonderful series of papers by Dyson in the 60s, uh, the statistical theory of energy levels, where he does that and, and much more. OK. And now let's move away from the random metric theory world. Let's do some basic um, statistical physics. Assume we have n particles in Rd. That's their positions in Rd. And for any state, so for any uh, n-tuple of position, I can define some energy, which is given by the physical laws of the system. Then you could ask, well, the, the point of view of, of statistical physics is to treat the state of the system as being random. And the probability of observing a certain state is proportional to the Boltzmann factor, which is this. And beta is 1 over the physical temperature. That's called the Gibbs measure. So as we see, maybe the, the, the summary of this is that random eigenvalues of random matrices, they behave exactly like particles in a statistical physics system. So uh, random eigenvalues, in a sense, well, for certain models, are equivalent to particles in R or in C. And the energy would be, um, well, whatever is written here. So this 
Item. So this is the logarithmic interaction. And this is what we call a confining potential. So uh, a, few, a few words. Um, this is repulsive. Why? So as you can see um, in the Gibbs measure, if you have a high energy, you're very unlikely to be observed. So you like to be low energy. If two particles are far away, this is very negative. So you have a very negative energy. So it's likely, or um, maybe the other way around. If you have two particles that are very close, you have, you have a very uh, high energy here. So you, you have a very low probability of observing things. So that's a repulsive logarithmic interaction. So if we didn't write this term, they would just fly away. We need to confine them by uh, saying, well, there's a certain cost of being, of being far away. Um, so most of my uh, interest is in studying those systems and related systems. So you can replace the, the logarithmic interaction by the Coulomb interaction in dimension uh, bigger than 3. Log is the Coulomb interaction in dimension 2. And there, there are two reasons that you can study the systems. They have some connection with random matrix theory, especially in dimension 1, and also in, on a more anecdotal way in dimension 2. But they are also interesting in the statistical physics point of view, mostly because this interaction is long range. It doesn't decay. It doesn't tend to 0 at infinity, but um, it doesn't decay fast. Uh, when particles are far away. So in a sense, every particle feels the effect of all the other particles, and that creates difficulties in the analysis. Okay. So let me tell you uh, um, some things that we know about those systems. There are two, two relevant scales. The first scale is when, so I will do uh, dimension 1 and dimension 2. Uh, when you have pa n particles um, in a compact um, domain, so at a, at a big, big O of 1, size of big O of 1, that's the global scale or the macroscopic scale. And then you can zoom in. So if you want to reach the interparticle distance, you have to zoom by n or square root of n, depending on, on your uh, dimension. And then you reach the local scale or um, microscopic scale. And so in the, in the macroscopic scale, so the global scale, the interesting object is this. So I put a Dirac mass at each point, and I divide by n. So I have a probability measure on r or c, which encodes the global behavior of the particles. If you, if you go at the micro scale, one thing that's relevant to do is to fix a point here. Let's call it y star or here. It doesn't have to be a particle. It's just one point. And you want to look at what happens at the local scale around y star. So you will take each particle and then center around y star and then multiply by the right thing. And you don't divide by n. So here you have a collection of points that describe the local configuration around y star. That's the local scale observable. And um, OK, so you could ask, is there a typical behavior? Maybe I can call that cn. Is there a typical behavior for those quantities? Um, it is known for the, the macroscopic scale. It was known for a long time. There is a, a limiting object. In R, it's the semicircle low, the semicircle distribution. So that's a density which has the shape of a semicircle. And in C, it would be the circular low. So that's just the uniform measure on the unit disk. Um, and there is a variational principle attached to it that describes this object as the unique minimizer of a reasonable functional. Um, in, for the microscopic scale, the small scale, it's more complicated. Um, the limit was uh, found to exist for every beta. Uh, so beta is, once again, it's this uh, temperature parameter um, f in dimension 1. Um, but in dimension 2, it's only known 
for beta equals 2. It's, it's, and it's due to Genim. And the reason that, of course, the, the local scale is m more difficult is that you have more precise information on your particles. So it's more difficult to say what happens. Um, and with, um, with my PhD supervisor, we, we gave a variational principle that describe whatever limit come here. So there, there was a variational principle at the global scale, and we gave one at the microscopic scale. Uh, in one minute, I can tell you some interesting phenomenon that occur with those systems. Maybe the most striking one is the following. Take phi a smooth function on R or C, and apply test it against every particle. That's a random quantity, so I can look at its variance. And it's bounded. So for IID particles, you would get big O of n. So that's um, an example of the rigidity phenomenon for the systems. They have a very small variance <laughs> um, in, in many different senses. You can also look at the variance of the number of points in a box. And that's much smaller than the expectation of the number of points. If you had a Poisson point process, this would be the same order. So of course, there is this interaction. So points are not IID, but they are strongly not IID. Um, OK, so in the last um, two minutes, I can tell you about two open problems that I would like to be solved, certainly not by me, but the, the description was just two que questions that you would like to be, that you would like to see solved. So um, the, f the first, so these two open problems are in dimension two. Dimension one is mostly well understood, and uh, for sorry, yeah, at, and at the at the local scale, the the global scale is also pretty well understood. The first question is the question of crystallization. And it's just the question of what is the infinite configuration with minimal energy. So you can define, there is a way to define the interaction energy, the logarithmic interaction energy for infinitely many points. Uh, so you could ask what's the best configuration. And it's not known. Uh, the conjecture is that it's the triangular lattice or the, the A2 root system. Uh, as some of you may prefer to say. Um, but it's, it's, it's completely open. And I think it's, it's fun to put that in regard with the recent progress on sphere packing in dimension 8 and 24 that was done by uh, Vizovska and, and, and her co-others. They, so they, the, they have sold the sphere packing. And they also actually have proven that these lattices are universally optimal. So for a wide class of interaction, the best way to arrange points is this lattice these lattices, and it's not known in dimension two. And the other big question um, in, in that uh, field is the, is the existence of a phase transition. So again, in dimension two, um, and at the, at the local scale. So in the 80s, there was a series of numerical studies on those systems. And they consistently, consistently so you found that around B equals 140, there is some phase transition. The nature of this is not clear, at least not clear to me. They call it crystallization. So naively, it seems like they would say, oh, after a certain temperature, you become a crystal. So um, I can give you names. I, I do, sorry. <laughs> um, um, but, we, but for sure, I know that it's not, that's not possible. You cannot just see a pure crystal. It, one reason that I know is that I have a variational principle for what happens at the local scale. And this has infinite value for this. So it's certainly not the minimizer at the local scale. Uh, but, but what happens here is very much uh, um, you intriguing. Yeah. Do you know the smoothness of your solution in beta? I'm sorry? Do you know the dependence of your solution in beta? That no, no. Well, no. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you.